well, thank you very much uh, for, the, for the invite and thank you all for, for making it here. And yes, I will be talking about water. So this is actually an offshoot of my PhD uh, research, which I did ages ago. I uh, uh, actually finished in 2006, so it's a long, long time ago. But anyway, um, one of the things that I was very interested in was the, the ancient water uh, management system that you have in the Andes, especially in the northern Andes, and in particular these structures, but I'll be talking about others as well. And these are, this is a, a Rico Cocha Alta Dam, which is located at 4,560 meters. Uh, and we now know, because we've, we've been able to date it, that it, uh, that some of the sediments in it date to between the 13th to 15th century AD. So we're, we're looking at what would have been sort of the local culture, uh, the wireless, and then most likely going into the Inca period. But we also have data, and I'll show them in, in the talk, of, of even earlier stuff. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll try to explain how all these things uh, came about and why they came about uh, in the talk, and then move on to the, the, the latest bit of my project, which is actually rehabilitating these things. So it's, it's bringing, it's looking at, at heritage, but heritage as well as, as a, as sort of functional heritage beyond uh, just the war restoration, but actually bringing water to, to present day communities, hence the past water futures uh, idea. Um, <clears throat> because, does it move? Was moving before. Shall I? Yeah, there we go. So, um, oh. that's working. Is that working now? Okay. Uh, so basically, we uh, water is going to be is is the topic one of the biggest topics in the twenty first century, and water availability across the world is, is and water security is a is an ever increasing problem. And Peru is on one of these front lines, okay? So uh, Peru and the Central Andes has, uh, is one of the largest tropical glaciers uh, in the area. And uh, most of them are supposed to, uh, are estimated to disappear by uh, 2050. Um, and climate change is obviously accelerating this. Uh, and Lima most likely will face shortages by 2030. Um, especially in the highlands, uh, you have a lot of water stress in, uh, with many of the communities. Also, the population of the highlands had recovered from the down, from the, the drastic downfall that occurred with the coming of the Spaniards in the 16th century. And by now, there's more people living in the highlands and, and water is becoming an increasing problem. Um, and the solution to many, to the, the, the go-to solution has been to create micro dams, modern micro dams. Okay, um, so but you have large dams, reservoirs, and irrigation systems. Most of the, since, uh, as of 2015, there were 750 uh, high altitude micro dams, and now the figure is closer to 900, okay? These are, are built from steel and cement, and we'll go into that later on. Uh, but one of, the, one of the problems with steel and cement is that uh, they tend to fail. The, the, the life expectancy, of a dam with with minimum maintenance uh is between 40 to 50 years the actual reality is that in the andes uh it's usually between 20 and 30 years because of the seismic activity that you have concrete dams tend to be incredibly rigid and in a seismic zone they tend to crack okay so we'll, we'll see this later on anyway uh and what i've been trying to do well for 20 years really i was trying to uh, once i'd i'd uh, recorded all these systems uh what i was always interested in trying in, in doing was to to do a pilot project and actually rehabilitate one of these dams and we finally managed to do it we would have done it before covid because that's when we had the money but then covid chucked everything out of the window so we only managed to do it last year uh and that's what i want to to show you later on but anyway that's that's sort of a, an introduction um and this is the area that i work in so i work in, in what's called the angash highlands um there's two mountain ranges. So you've got the Cordillera Negra and the Cordillera Blanca, the white mountains and the black mountains. The difference between them, the Spanish were not very imaginative when it came to names, mm -hmm. is that the white mountains uh, have ice on top and the black mountains don't. Okay. So water stress, if if there was water stress in the in the in the white mountains, and there has been, 
nevertheless, they have uh, glacial supply. In the black, uh, in the black Cordillera, Cordillera Negra, that was never an, uh, there was never a glacier. So the water stress is even is even higher. Just to give you an idea, um, in in the Cordillera Blanca area, uh, it's about 1,000 millimeters of rain a year. In the Cordillera Negra, it's 500. So they even get less rainfall as well. Uh, we know. Uh, we, have a, we have a good idea that this water stress probably started in what's called the middle horizon. The middle horizon is a period between 600 and 1000 AD, uh, when we know that there was climate change and it became drier and hotter. Uh, so climate change is not just nowadays, it was also happening in the past. And that, this is when we see a huge investment across the Andes, really, in a hydraulic technology, be it uh, canals, be it dams, be it terracing which is what you get across most of the Andes. And anyway, this is the area that I've been working in uh, in particular. We've registered over 100 uh, sites in this, in this area between mortuary monuments, uh, wankas, which are sacred stones, uh, dams, etc. Right, so this is what I've, I've been working on. Uh, this, is the, uh, this is a sort of more detailed uh, map of, of, the, of the sites and so forth. And when I was doing my PhD, I recorded 29 hydraulic structures, right? Between water dams, silt dams, and I'll explain this later, silt reservoirs and water reservoirs. Here we have another one uh, of, these, of these dams. This is actually an Inca one. Uh, so this is probably end of the 15th, beginning of the 16th century. Uh, and it's 100 meters across, just to give you an idea, 100 meters across, three meters wide, and about five meters high. So they're big structures, okay? And they're made from stone, uh, and uh, they're faced with stone on both sides, and the, and the inside core is made out of uh, gravel and clay. Okay. So, the important thing about this hydro, uh, this this landscape, is that you get these different systems: the silt reservoirs, the the water reservoirs, the silt dams, and the, and the water dams in series. You don't find them sort of higgledy-piggledy in the landscape. They, they are parts of watershed uh, systems, water, watershed management systems, in small micro valleys. So what uh, uh, this, uh, this part of the Andes is incredibly steep. You go from the coast up to, uh, so from zero up to 5,000 meters in less than 50 kilometers. So it's, it's, it's short and it's short and steep. And what you tend to get is a series of micro valleys and within these micro valleys at the very top, you get these water lakes, okay? And you get these water lakes because uh, the underlying geology at the very top is andesite. And andesite uh, is a very hard stone, but uh, it cracks quite easily, okay? So it manages to, to hold water, but at the same time, through the cracks, it has a 10% uh, porosity uh, factor it will allow water to seep through and then it would come, it comes out in springs further down, okay? So the, as I said, the, 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 the underlying geology at the top bit is this andesite. As I said before, the Cordillera Negra is characterized by a lack, by a serious lack of water. And we know in the past, it's changed obviously in, in, in the present, that we had a very integrated agro-pastoralist economy. Because the valleys are quite short and steep, you can go from, from sort of, farming areas, here you can see sort of the remnants of terracing up to uh, sort of gra uh, tundra grassland, which is where you have the camlets quite quickly. And the communities tended to be quite compressed and the use of the land was quite compressed, okay? Uh, it is also the last extension of Puna. Puna is this uh, tundra grassland uh, characteristic of the Andes. So it's actually the last area where you would have uh, expected to have had big herds of animals in the past. Uh, it is because of or the relative short, shortness. It is a, uh, it's an important communication axis between the coast and the highlands, or this area. You get, for instance, in this part of, of northern Peru, from the coast to the jungle in 250 kilometers. It's nothing. It's really, really short. Uh, and what we know about veneration uh, in the past from, from the material evidence, and I won't get into that now, but if you want to ask me, you can do, you can do so later on, is that there's a, a generalized veneration of thunder and lightning. What would have been, uh, the local god would have been Libyak. And we know this because uh, when the Spaniards came, uh, Andean gods tended to be supplanted by Christian saints. And the saint that they used was Santiago, which is the, the uh, patron saint of Spain. Uh, but at the same time, Santiago is someone that, that comes across on a horse with a sword, and they use that as a depiction of lightning. Okay, uh, so 
whenever you find a veneration of Santiago, it's usually uh, on top of uh, an earlier uh, deity to lightning and thunder. Right. To give you an idea of this of this sort of integrated technology that we have, this is one of these micro valleys. This is the the valley of Chorrillos. This goes from from about four thousand eight hundred all the way down to three thousand eight hundred. This is a little more than four point five kilometers, and at the very top, you get a water dam. Okay, this is a, a, a pre-Hispanic one. It's called Orcon Cocha. Orcon means male, so it's male lake. And if you look, there's a little lake down there, which is also down, and it's called Warami Cocha, and it's female lake. So it's again the duality between uh, male and female, something which is very common in the Andes. So this is at the very top of this watershed. Uh, uh, you have um, these two water dams. Just below it, you've got Yanacocha, Black Lake, another huge uh, pre-Hispanic lake. That's that you can see the flat dam there. Uh, it holds, it's estimated to hold about half a million cubic uh, meters of, of water. So it's a, it's a big, it's a big construction. Then below this, you get what I, what I term silt dams. This is not made to contain water. What it's made to do is to create a peatland behind it. And this peatland would have been uh, important for the, for the camelids during uh, the dry season. The dry season goes normally from about the end of May through till August, beginning of September, when there's very little rain. So when all the, when all the pasture has been consumed, the animals, even nowadays, tend to be taken to these sorts of, uh, sorts of areas where they, for a few months, they can, they can uh, uh, browse on high grade pasture and then the rains come and then the whole cycle starts again. Uh, and you tend to get these just below water dams. And then below that, you have what are called silt reservoirs. It's the same idea as the silt dams, it's little horseshoe uh, walling. And behind it, you have, uh, which diverts the water from the main, from the main river. And what, um, what you have behind it is the creation of small peatlands. Uh, <clears throat> all of this is artificial peatland. And then below this, you get terracing. This is abandoned agricultural terracing. And below that, you get water reservoirs. So in 4.5 kilometers, you're going from, from 4,800, a complete uh, herder landscape, all the way down to a farming landscape in, as I said, 4.5 kilometers. It's, it's short and very quick okay so the the communities that that lived here in uh, in the pre-hispanic period <clears throat> would have had both an agricultural and a herding component and that's important to know okay so this is uh, to give you an idea of what these little peat reservoirs look like okay you can't you can't really see it when you look at it in the landscape well you can see that one there you can see the wall there uh, there we go. And there you can see how it creates little, and they're still working, they're not maintained, and they're still working uh, 500 years after they were built. And we, we know that this is 500 years old because we took a date behind one of the walls and it's Inca. So the date came end of the 15th century. Okay, that's to give you, so it, it's, it's, most, it's likely that the peat, the peat already, the small patches of peat existed, and what they're doing with this is augmenting the, the area available for peat production. Right, this is the valley that I'm going to be talking about from, from here on in, uh, especially this dam. This is the dam that we selected to be uh, for rehabilitation. This is the Rico uh, micro valley. The one that we looked at before is just off the picture here, but that's the Yanacocha lake, the, the really big lake that I showed you just now, just off the picture there. So it's very close to the other valley. It's, it's, uh, we are probably about eight kilometers away. And again, you have the same features, right? The same types of features. So again, it's, it's, it's it, this, the system I just showed you before is replicated uh, throughout the landscape. Um, this particular valley is seven kilometers long. Uh, again, an agro-pastoralist economy, wireless Inca landscape, uh, wireless being the, the local group. And what you get at the very top is a water dam, right? So that's Rico Concha Alta. Below that one, I hope you can see it, the plan. You get another water dam called Rico Cochabaja. I've only put the plan here because later on I'm going to show you some pictures of Rico Cochabaja. Uh, below that, you get these silt reservoirs again. 
and below that you get a massive uh, silt dam, which actually behind it uh, captures almost 40 hectares of peatland. Uh, and associated to, to this huge uh, <laughs> silt a dam, we have uh, an Inca administrative site with, I won't go into details, but it's got Inca administrative buildings, it's got plazas, it's got a, it's got a, an ocean, which is a, a type of platform, and the, the dam is here, and the Inca site is just alongside it. So again, it's a sort of state control of a huge area of, of peatland, most likely for, for animals. Okay, this is, this is uh, the the Rico Cocha, sorry, the Colpacocha Dam, which is the silt dam at the bottom. And now we're coming into sort of more uh, the topic I really want to talk about. And it's this, this idea that we have when we, go, when we go to Peru, or well, when we go to the Andes and, and we look at the landscape and Clark Erickson very, uh, summarizes this very well, government planners, development agencies, staff and tourists look at the rural areas of the Andes and see utter misery, backwardness and ignorance. Anthropologists, archaeologists, and geographers see a beautiful idyllic landscape filled with happy peasants employing deep indigenous knowledge and sophisticated technology. It's two extremes. The reality is actually neither one nor the other. Okay, and it's it's really difficult uh, to do the sort of project that I've I've managed to do. It as I said, it's taken me twenty years to do it because there's a lot of resistance from different from different uh, sort of sectors. Okay, and we'll look at that in in, in a bit more detail later. So. The idea of Colpacocha, this is to, to give you an, uh, an idea of what's happening with, with this site. It's, uh, the silt dam is a, um, sort of more like a sieve than a dam. So it, it, uh, oh, um, excess water flows out from three sluices. And, what, uh, and the, the land behind remains waterlogged to, the, to a certain degree. And then uh, you have peat creation, okay? Uh, so it's from the wildlife culture with income modification. Again, it's 10, 100 meters long, six meters high, 11 meters wide, uh, and the modern communities are clamoring for this for this dam to be um, to be made into a massive water dam. And I've been fighting with them for the past 15 years, more or less, saying that if you build a water dam here, it's going to silt over quite quickly. Okay. So this is. A plan of the dam gives you an idea of what it is, and this is uh, one of. Uh, this is uh, uh, and basically, and basically, if you read if you read the the description there, there this is an area that they use for pasture. But nevertheless, what they need is water. The, the biggest uh, need in the in the area is water scarcity, and they see this as potentially an area where where they could have a massive water dam. Okay, uh, so this gives you an idea of the Gol of Golpacocha and the silt behind it. This is a more modern picture of it. It's now being plowed up. Actually, uh, it's becoming much much drier, and they plowed out uh, plowed, plowed up the the. Um, the peat to plant potatoes. Okay, but what we do know is that um, you've got the dam here. We took uh, soil samples before they planted from a depth of, uh, well, different depths, but the, the behind the wall, between uh, a depth of 146 to 147 centimeters. We've got a radiocarbon date for it, and it is exactly that period that I was telling you about when there's this explosion of. Um, Hydraulic uh, engineering throughout the Andes. So this is this is the middle horizon. Uh, the middle horizon goes between 600 and 1,000, and the date that we got uh, at 95 percent probability is 772 to 958. And as so happens, when we got the date, a local farmer from uh, a community down here called Breke took me to his fields, and he found this pottery. And this pottery is what's known uh, locally as Wadi Norteño which is also a bit of a horizon. So now we have the material correlates to the dates that we got from the dam, which is quite nice. But anyway, so this is this is the silt dam. So we have a landscape which has been used at least from, from about uh, the eighth century all the way through. There's in high investment in it, uh, especially in, in hydraulic infrastructure. And 
there's uh, this is, these are Inca bench terracing just here on the Inca side that I told you that's just beside the, the dam. Uh, but nowadays, um, this dam has been used for other purposes. So one of the reasons why this dam is, is drying up is because they decided to regulate the flow. So this is obviously modern. And what's, what's this has meant is that water no longer goes to the side of, of the basin and this, um, the peat has dried up, right? They also decided to do a salmon farm, farm uh, in 2017 and it lasted six months. Uh, there was not enough water, all the fish died and it was abandoned, okay? Uh, and this is part of the problem that we're having. There's a huge investment by, by local uh, municipalities and outside NGOs of bringing cement and building with cement throughout, throughout the zone, whether this works or whether it doesn't, okay? Um, and this is one of the, the parad uh, paradigmic problems that we have, really. Uh, so these are the modern agents that we tend to contend with. Uh, there's the peasant communities, who are clamoring for water. There's the national and regional government of Peru, which uh, are in power for four years and then they, they get renewed. And it's in their interest to, to build infrastructure, be it football pitches or reservoirs or uh, whatnot. There's mining companies and a way of offsetting tax is to give money to the communities. There's a, there's a, a tax called the um, mining, mining uh, canon minero, and they give money to different communities that then use it for projects. There's NGOs like Caritas, Programa de Cordillera Negra, Junta de Desarrollo de Bambaramas, et cetera, et cetera, who again give money, bring experts in, they build uh, this cement infrastructure and then they leave. And then there's us, archaeologists and anthropologists who sort of parachute in for like three weeks or four weeks and then parachute out. And we have very, very little influence on actual, the decisions that occur uh, at sort of the ground level. And that's part of the part of the problem that we've been having. So I'm going to give you an example of Rico Cochabaja. This is how it looked in 2002 when I did my survey. It's a beautiful. It was a beautiful dam. Uh, had six sluices uh, in the past. Obviously a water dam. Uh, and when I went in 2008, it had been cemented over. They'd uh, done it uh, with cement. And what's interesting is that the, the way they talk about this material, they call it material noble, noble material. So cement and steel is seen as noble material as opposed to stone and clay. Okay, so that's, and it's really hard to, to counteract that thinking that this is better material than the old material. But this, as I said, this was built in 2000 and 2008. And six months later, there was a, there was a big tremor. And this is what happened with the dam. So the dam didn't even work for six months. So when I said at the beginning that the life expectancy of a dam in the Andes, a steel and, and concrete dam is between 20 to 30 years, sometimes it can be a lot less, okay? And this, to a certain extent, helped me because this failed so quickly, the community then said, right, uh, maybe we should try a different system, okay? And this is before I go into, into, into the last work that I've been doing. This is a, a, re a report that was done in 2008 uh, by Jaime Yosa uh, Laure. And look at this. These are all the modern dams in the area, right? Ricococha um, dammed in very bad condition. Caruacocha dammed in uh, sort of medium condition, valve not working. Uh, Chakicocha, valve not working. Negra Huacanan, uh, valve not working. There's a pattern in this. Uh, Yanacocha, valve not working. Pakirancocha, this is the only dam that was working in 2008 of the modern ones. These are the old ones. These are the pre-Hispanic ones. Milicocha, <coughs> pre-colonial, operative. Tocanca, pre-colonial, semi-operative. Colpa, uh, which is the one that I showed in the silt dam, so I, I contend that it was never meant as a water dam, inoperative because of sedimentation. Actually, sedimentation was the purpose of that dam. So again, we get a pattern where the modern dams uh, are not working, uh, and the know-how to repair them or the money to repair them is not there in the local communities anymore because these are sort of money that's parachuted in and expertise that's parachuted in. The people are not engineers. There's no engineers there as in modern engineers. Uh, so these uh, modern dams 
nobody maintains them and they and they fall into disrepair relatively quickly augmenting the problem of, of water scarcity right so what i've been doing is we selected one of these pre-hispanic dams and we decided to rehabilitate it we've got money we got money from uh, germany to do this and this is this is the the dam of ricococha alta so ricococha baja was the one that failed completely and what we did last year was uh, between july and august is a uh, a pilot project to rehabilitate Cocha Alta. Uh, the concrete dam that was built just below had only been functional for six months, and the pilot, uh, this pilot project was was uh, successful in, in establishing a proof of concept for the rehabilitation stage, and it serves as a blueprint for future dam restoration. That's the idea. The project is called Hard, um, just because, um, and we will be monitoring the the dam. Uh, over the next over the next year to see because obviously we did it, this during the dry season that's the only time that you can work on the dam so we're we're going to be monitoring it this year we estimate that uh, the dam will hold about thirty thousand uh, cubic meters of water and it, this one dam will directly impact one hundred families in Cajabamba the community of Cajabamba Alta and uh, Budaka uh, whilst contributing water to further two hundred fifty households. In total, we're looking at about 1,200 people. Okay, uh, might seem like small fish, but actually uh, small fry. But actually, these are these are uh, big communities for the area. Uh, the water that uh, that will be provided by this dam will be used mainly for for peas and for the uh, and for the downstream for avocado. And these are exports. Uh, products as in export out of the zone they're not going to the international market but these are these are products that they can actually sell in nearby towns to bring cash into families and actually the other uh, um, since then I've learned that they've been using the water as well for to get more cows because they have a small art uh, artisan cheese factory uh, so they will be happy, they will be making more cheese that they can also sell in the market so what we did is we took the dam, we cleaned the outside of the dam, and then uh, we took out the whole core of, of the dam. We left the two walls standing and we replaced the core. So th the idea, the concept that I have is that uh, we will restore these, these structures, so providing a sort of a heritage uh, structure, recreating it, uh, sort of taking it back to what it would have been like in the past, but at the same time, uh, integrating modern technology because obviously there has been certain uh changes over the past 500 years which will make the dam even better so uh and the important thing thing is that the, te the technology that we bring in has to be uh flexible it can't be rigid like the cement that uh, has been used for the for the modern micro dams so that what we have put in is geomembrane so that it makes the dam um much more uh, it, it can hold water much much easier than than it would have done in the past. All these dams would have bled water through it, but the, uh, and it will continue to bleed water because the geomembrane that we used is not the thickest. Uh, but it would bleed less water, so it will hold water uh, behind in a, in a better way. So we we've been we cleaned the dam on the outside, then we cleaned the dam on the inside. We took the core all the way down, then we put the geomembrane in. We put a modern sluice uh, inside and covered it, and then we, we started replacing the core again using material, uh, the same material that would have been inside. So it's a, it's a mixture of gravel and clay, which is the same way that they build their own the, the canals nowadays, the irrigation canal. So again, it is technology that they are aware of and technology that they are, they they know how to use. So we don't need outside uh, outside help. It was very cold up there. Then we brought the stones back up again, the stones that had collapsed before, and we reclayed the outside wall. Then we pressed uh, the core all the way in. And we ended up, this is what the dam looked like before we started, and that's how the dam ended up at the very end. And the interesting thing with this is that if you try to do a modern micro dam, it usually takes you two to three years to get the permits because it has to go through the water ministry, it has to go through the agricultural ministry, has to go through through a lot of bureaucracy. Uh, and then it takes probably another year to build. Uh, we managed to do the restoration in two months. 
it cost a tenth of what it would have cost uh, a cement dam, and you only have to go to the Ministry of Culture because it's a it's a wall basically that we are rehabilitating. We just have to go to the Ministry of Culture and get a permit from them to restore one wall. So it was the the whole bureaucratic thing was a hell of a lot simpler as well, right? So this gives you an idea of us working. This is when we were taking the core out and putting the geomembrane in. So uh, what we're looking at here is applied archaeology and heritage preservation. Um, as I said before, uh, the existing micro dams in, in the Andes are constructed of concrete, but there's a lot of, of um, installed capacity already existing in the, in the Andes. We estimate that just in the Cordillera Negra, there's probably, if we count all the valleys, there's probably in the region of 400 to 450 pre-Hispanic dams. Uh, it is, uh, it is what we're proposing is much more sustainable. Uh, the, uh, as I said to you, the only one of the 10 concrete dams is fully functional and all three um, existing pre-Hispanic dams in that report were functioning. It is much, much cheaper by a factor of 10. Uh, and it's quicker. We can use the community. They can. They can. They are fully integrated into the project, uh, and it usually takes months rather than years. Uh, and at the same time, we are preserving cultural heritage, which is incredibly important because many of these structures, whenever they do, uh, one thing I, I failed to mention before is that the modern micro dams are built on top, or well, in the same position as the old uh, pre-Hispanic dam. So they tend to destroy the old pre-Hispanic dam, and they built the concrete micro dam on top. It is environmentally friendly. We used seven bags of cement for the for the sluice as opposed to 4,000, which is the usual number that you use for, for one of these things. Uh, and it has it, it, it allows the communities to have much more local control of what they're doing. Uh, and the impact is, is direct uh, to the communities very, very quickly. Um, as I said, cement dams have been the established go-to solution. And this project, uh, what we're trying to do is provide a, para, a paradigm shift to, see, uh, to, to look at cultural heritage resources and traditional approaches to, to water management, which we know work because they definitely worked a thousand years ago. So the proof of concept was already done 1,000 years ago. What we're doing is reapplying it. Okay, so towards the future, the lack of water and community appeal for this, for this resource is a constant and is only gonna grow. Uh, rehabilitation of ancient dams is a must for both heritage and functional reasons. Uh, and what we need is a paradigm shift away from this idea of noble material being cement and, and steel. Uh, the, the project I did uh, was funded by the Goethe Henkel Foundation, but I am working uh, now on, on the Past Water Futures project, uh, which is a project between Argentina, Germany, Peru, uh, the UK and the US. And in the future, what we're looking at is to do a digital survey and hotspotting of different areas are across the Cordillera, Cordillera Negra so that we know we really get a grip on how many of these structures are still in existence and how many of them can still be uh, rehabilitated. And then this will lead hopefully to further restoration. So really we need to ask ourselves, do we wanna have this, which lasts for about 20 to, this one in particular has already broken down since I took the picture. So do we want this, which has a life expectancy of 30 years, or do we want this, which still holds water more than 500 years after it was built? Thank you very much for your time.